Okay, enough talking. I want you to look at pictures. This was taken in a graveyard in Moscow. This place, to me, is a, a, a photo museum, I mean, a sculpture garden. Because when, when a dignitary died, they'd hire an artist, and the artist would do a rendering of that individual. A dancer might be somebody dancing, or just a pair of ballet shoes. An astronaut, there's, there's one sculpture of an astronaut in full clothing, you know, astronaut clothing. Uh, this, apparently a musician had passed away, and there are leaves on it, and it's dirty, and all that other stuff. But when I make a, a 16 by 20, and I mat and frame it, and put it over our piano, uh, it looks wonderful. Debbie and I have discussed that everything I do is street photography. I don't know if street photography really applies, it's just photography. I'm always looking for a moment, a special moment, that's going to be interesting. This is at a wedding, a friend of mine in Vermont. But from there on, the wedding exists to me with a 28, a 24, or a 21 millimeter lens, and get close. Not easy, because there are certain personality types that just don't do it. Now, this is why I don't get too many wedding jobs. <laughs> Most people don't want this. You know, they want wedding photographers, whatever they are. And I don't mean to put them down because they, you know, they work hard, they do, they do a nice job presenting their stuff. But to me, it's cold, it's clean, it's color, and it goes in a plastic album. And they're craftsmen. They're good at what they do. Technically, they know what they're doing. But I don't consider them artists at all. This one kid said the reason he used the Zoom was so he wouldn't interfere with anybody. He wouldn't get in anybody's way. So he'd stand back and just grab these shots. I said, you know, I can teach a monkey how to do that. It's when you get three or four feet away from somebody and take a picture like this and become unnoticed. Right, you're noticed once the flash goes off, you're noticed. So you're quick. The thing that attracted me mostly to this, besides the kids, which I love, and the swimming, but the backdrop was New York City. And you'll see it in some other pictures. Uh, boats, huge boats. The Queen Mary come up, sailboats would come up, and the background was always changing. It was organic. You take a picture like this, which is interesting to look at, because what it does to the viewer, I was there, so I know what was happening, but the viewer doesn't. And the viewer gets involved with this photograph because they're questioning it. So what is happening there? If that's what happens from the viewer, then I've succeeded. I've engaged the viewer. I'm hoping to do a book on weddings, and I'm hoping to use this as the cover. I love this photograph. I don't get really whacked out about a lot of photographs, but this one, it's inexplicable. There's something about it that I liked very much. There was another young photographer there, and he had a strobe with a sensor on it and an umbrella you know, and all that stuff that I shun. And this was shot without a flash. And it's twilight, as you can see, and the sun's behind them. So I can go probably up to 10,000 or 12,000 with this photograph, and it's still clean as a whistle. There's no, quote, noise, as, as today's generation is wont to say. This was part of the barn that the uh, reception was held in. And looking out the window was this wonderful picture. Hoboken, New Jersey, the Feast of St. Anne. I see an old man walking down the street. And, you know, I can stand up and take a whole bunch of pictures. But this picture, I said, I've got to get low. I've got to get real low. And I don't even want to see his head. I just want to see his, his body hunched over, which 
spells to me his age. So I got real low, and that made the picture much more dramatic. You know, so there are a lot of times where, where I see people, when they're photographing children or a dog or a cat, and they go, oh, look at that, how cute that is. And I look at it and I go, what happened to your knees? Go, what do you mean? I go, well, bend the things. Get down and look at their level. Get on the child's level, get on the animal's level, and look them in the eyes. Same thing here. I got way down. This is rather complete. On the extreme left is Carl Lewis. And if you don't remember the Olympics, he won the 100-yard dash, 200-yard dash, 400 relay, and the long jump. That's four gold medals. That's an unbelievable feat. Uh, Jim Gray is the announcer, the ABC announcer at that time. Muhammad Ali, Michael Phelps, the great swimmer, and I think one of the greatest boxers of all time, Sugar Ray Leonard, who happened to be the sweetest guy in the world. And, you know, they're just playing around. But again, I'm collecting these giants. Now, you're lucky when you get things like this. I love moments like this. You know, you're out shooting tennis and you're looking for forehands and backhands. And then when you get something silly like this, it really makes it. This was at the zombie parade in Asbury Park. And I found the people more interesting, you know, the photographers more interesting than the zombies, because they do anything for a picture. Photography is the new literacy. Pay attention. Ask a kid, when was the last time he wrote a letter or an essay uh, about American history? They don't write anything anymore. It's everything's on a computer. I said, but ask them the last time he took a picture. That day, with their cell phone, kids are always shooting pictures. There was a report by, I think it was Yahoo, that said, this year, 2015, there will be 800 billion photographs taken with regular cameras and cell phones. So why they're not teaching it in high school or even elementary school, I don't know. And if any of you are teachers or you know teachers, say, wake up, you're, you're being left behind. These kids are burying you with vision and you don't understand it. I'm not the first one to say this, but there are only two rules in photography. The first rule is there are no rules. The second rule is if you happen to find one and you want to break it, break it. Break the rule. And if you can't fight and you can't, can't flee, flow. Uh, Ansel Adams said the negative is the score He's talking about music and the print, the performance. And if you think about that, he's, he's absolutely right. And this was in film. Same thing applies here. You know, the score is the original photograph, but the performance is going to be working that up. And he was equating that to music because he was a uh, classical pianist, as far as I understand. Now, this is where you really get in trouble. When you stop on the Jersey Turnpike, you get out of your car <laughs> and you're looking back at Jersey City because I was going home and I'm looking at that and I'm going, oh my God, I got to get that. And in those days I was using SLRs and I shot this with a 500 millimeter mirror lens, the old Nikon mirror lenses, you know, and trying to hand hold it at a 60th of a second because I didn't have much, much light. You know, and, and you're trying to weigh, you're saying, okay, what, what the hell is that foreground lit for? And then what's the, I know what the background is. You know, I got to stop it down for the background to get those gold bricks. But I want some detail in the foreground, otherwise you're not going to, so that's it. I, I do this quite often, but maybe not often enough. Uh, there was a storm 
by my house and there were leaves blowing all over the place. And I passed by, and this is where you have to have spent time in the dark room. Because when I look at a situation like this, I don't just see a tree stump, you know. I see tonal values. And that's what I notice more than anything, is the tonal values. And I go, this will make a great print if I just take my time and expose it properly. And I got tonal values. I don't know if it's a great photograph, but it's a lot of fun for me, and it's interesting. This is something that happens, I think, only in New Jersey. I'll stand corrected if somebody from Long Island says, hey, we do it too, um, or Staten Island or any place else. But in New Jersey, when a volunteer fire department, and we have all these little towns in New Jersey, and they all, had vol all have volunteer fire departments. And what happens is when one of them gets a new apparatus, you know, a new super pumper, a hook and ladder, or whatever, it has to be baptized. And there's a whole ritual about this. So other volunteer fire departments from other communities come with their super pumpers and their hoses, and they have this, this fight between the two, of the two of the fire departments. So you got one department, you know, with its new baby, fighting off these other guys that came to baptize it. So, and then you'll have an idiot like me that says, I'm not gonna stand on a sidewalk and shoot this with a long lens. I'm gonna follow those guys and get in close. And that to me makes the photograph, is you gotta get in close. Okay, so you're gonna get wet, okay? If you don't want to get wet, find another profession or another hobby. Take up, take up clay molding and stuff. All you do is get your hands dirty. But as a photographer, you're going to get dirty and you're going to get wet. See what happens when you get in close? Remember I said I, don't, I shoot in color and then transform it to black and white. I had to leave this in color because this made sense in color. Same thing here. This worked in color. I don't find the color distracting. You know, I don't shoot color for color's sake like Jay Maisel does. I mean, Jay's brilliant with that. Uh, but I don't have that kind of vision. And you can see the power of those hoses. So, again, you're taking your chances by getting close because you get hit with one of those hoses, you're going, you're going back and on your butt. And when your camera gets wet, Sometimes providence is on your side because it gives you a delightful image like that. Another thing, we all do this, we're all guilty of this, is walking down a New York street and we look in a window, but we don't look closely enough at what's going on in the window. And this is a Saks Fifth Avenue window where the mannequin is lit up and there are all these people waiting for a bus alongside of it, so the, the story is more complete that way. There are twin images here. You got the twin images of the guy's arms and the twin towers. But the metaphor for me is the tension in the arms and the anticipation of what, what's about to come. Now, I gotta tell you, there's a backstory to this. I asked these kids to go up on the piling, which is on the extreme edge of the picture. And the piling is about anywhere from 20 to 25 feet out of the water, depending on the tide. And I said to the kids, you know, I'd love it if you guys went up on those twin pilings and then don't di dive off and I'll get the Trade Center in the background. They, they didn't know that. I said, I just want you diving. They said, yeah, okay, and I, I really had to cajole them. And they said, we'll only do it once. And I said, well, what's the big deal about doing it a, another time? They said, because we don't know what's in that river. <laughs> yeah, okay. You mean like an abandoned car or a dead horse, you know, or anything like that? And they were right. This, this was a very lucky shot because I was in this pool hall and it's slash 
bar. And as I was walking out, somebody called my name and I turned around and that's exactly how I saw them. And, and I had my camera on my side and I looked at them and I said, nobody moves. And I just took up my camera. I took three very quick shots. And to their everlasting credit, they didn't move. I didn't know if the camera was set properly or anything. You know, I just shot and very fortunate. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.